Would you agree with me that health is not contagious, but that illness is? I mean, think about it. If I'm, if I'm well and you're sick, let's say you have the flu, and I'm completely healthy, it's not like I can come and cough on you and sneeze on you and shake hands with you and kiss you and hug you, and somehow that's going to make you well, right? On the other hand, if you turn it around, if you turn it around and, and I'm sick and you're not sick and I do all those same things, what happens? You get sick. And I think most of us would agree with that. Most of us understand that when it comes to physical sickness. But for some reason, when it comes to, to spiritual sickness, I think we sometimes lose track of that. Sometimes I think we, we think if we just hang around holy people that somehow that we're going to get holy ourselves, it'll kind of rub off on us, or by osmosis that somehow we'll become holy, or, or we figure that, uh, that we can somehow prevent being infected by, by other people. But what we find is, is what we're going to talk about this morning is that, that holiness is not contagious, but sin is. Let me repeat that again. Holiness is not contagious, but sin is. And that's the message that we're going to look at this morning as we continue our study of the book of Haggai. Right now we're in the midst of a, a series called Little, Me Little uh, Books with a Big Message. And we've been going through some of the small books, the short ones, the ones we kind of tend to pass right over as we go through both the Old and the New Testament. And last week we, we came to the book of Haggai. And Haggai is the second shortest book in the Old Testament. The shortest book is Obadiah, which we'll take a look at next week. And last week we talked about the fact that, that in the book of Haggai, that there are these four messages that Haggai brings to the people of God. They're precisely dated. We know exactly when they happen because we were given a date for each one of those four messages. They happen in the year 520 B.C. from about September to December of that year. And last week we looked at the first of those messages. And the first, that first message was found in chapter 1 and it it took up all of chapter 1, and we looked at that. And this morning, we're going to look at chapter 2, and in chapter 2, we find the other three messages. But, but I don't really have time this morning to, to go into all three of those messages in detail. So what I'm going to do for you this morning, I'm going to kind of summarize a couple of those messages, and then we're going to spend our time looking at, at, at one of those messages in particular, the one that I think is probably most relevant to us this morning. The second message is found in the, first, or in the first part of Haggai chapter 2 in the first nine verses. If you have your Bibles, you might want to go ahead and open them up to the book of Haggai. Uh, again, these little books that are hard to find, no, no shame in using the table of contents if, if that's what you have to do to find them. Um, but in the first part of chapter 2, we find this second message that God brings to the people of Israel through the prophet Haggai. And in the message, here's what he's essentially saying to him. He's, he's talking to them, and, and he's particularly talking to a group of people who had known about the glory of the former temple. Some of them had probably seen it. There were probably a few people still alive who had seen the temple before Nebuchadnezzar came in about 50 years earlier than that and, and completely destroyed it, maybe 60 years earlier, I guess, and completely destroyed it. And they were thinking back, and they're rebuilding the temple now, and a lot of these people are saying, man, we really long for the good old days. I mean, back at the time when, when the temple was magnificent and glorious, and God has, has a message to those people. He says, first of all, three times he tells them to be strong. And then finally he tells them to get back to work. And I think today some of us have the same kind of tendency that, that the people of Israel had back then. You know, we have a tendency to look back and long for the good old days, don't we? You know, the days when there was prayer in schools, the days when, when we would read the Bible in school even. I can remember as, a, as an elementary school student having a Christmas pageant where we actually recited Scripture as part of that Christmas pageant. To, to long for those days when biblical marriage was, was held in high esteem in our country. To, to long for the days when our governmental leaders were, were guided by biblical principles. 
But I think the same message that God gave to the people who are trying to make the temple great again could be very applicable for us. They were to be strong and they were to get back to work. In fact, here's, here's how I would paraphrase the message that God gives to the people there. He says to them, don't look back. Don't reminisce about the past. I'm in control here. And one day, this temple that you're looking at, if you'll just continue to serve me, I'm going to make it even more magnificent than it was before. And I think that's the message that God has for us. Don't, don't look back. Don't focus on the past. Look ahead to the glorious future that I have for you because I'm going to do something that will totally blow your mind. And that was to encourage the people. So with that in mind, now let's pick up the second message. This is the one that I really want to spend the time on this morning to look at. It begins in chapter 10 of Haggai chapter, or verse 10 of Haggai chapter 2. Dave, you're a couple slides behind there. Here's what it says. It says, on the 24th day, of the ninth month, on the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus said the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priests answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priests answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat, to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you in all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since this day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing, but from this day on. I will bless you. This message comes a little over two months after the second message. It comes in probably December of, of the year 520 B.C. And that's an important time because at that time of the year, the, the people of Israel would have gone out and they would have sown their seed. And they would now be waiting for the winter rains to come to water that seed. And they didn't really know if that seed was going to produce a good crop or if they were going to have a drought like they'd been experiencing. And so they were totally dependent upon God at this time. They're continuing to do the, the work on the temple too here. And, and God comes to them and he, he addresses the people here. And he does it in a rather unusual way. He says, go ask the priests two questions. Now, to us, that seems kind of weird, doesn't it? I mean, why would they go ask the priests a couple of questions? But but back in that culture, we know that one of the important responsibilities of the priest was to help the people to live holy lives. Matter of fact, the prophet Ezekiel writes about that. He writes about how, how the priests were supposed to actually help the people to, to live holy lives. Here's what he writes in Ezekiel chapter 44. It says, They, speaking of the priests, shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. That was part of the job of the priest. And so, so Haggai says, I want you to ask the priest two questions. And we want to look at those two questions this morning, not only to see what did it mean for the people of Israel back then, but what does it mean for us today in the United States in the year 2018? So they asked two questions. The first question that was asked is, is this. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? Now, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us, but back then, they would have holy food. It was the, the meat that they had set aside for the offerings and for the sacrifices that God had, had told them to make. 
And when they carried it, they would tend to carry it in the fold of their clothing because they wanted to keep it separate from everything else. They didn't want it to touch just the ordinary food that they were carrying along with them. Be kind of like today, like this week I went to Sprouts and I ordered some meat at the butcher counter. What do they do? They take it and they wrap it in some paper to keep it from having contact with the rest of the food in your grocery bag. And that's kind of what was going on here. And, and so they're asking, you know, if you do that, does, does the holy meat, does it make everything else holy? And the priest rightly answered, no. They said, just, just the meat touching something else doesn't make it holier. As we've already put it this morning, holiness is not contagious. That's really what he's telling them here. He's telling them that you can't just like hang around with other holy people and that's going to be okay and we know from the from the text here that God's not real happy with these people look at what he calls them here you'd think he'd call them my people but he doesn't do that he says this people and this nation he doesn't call them my people because he understands that they have a heart problem here they're going about the work but but they're not really doing it with the right heart I think here's what was going on. There's a little bit of speculation here, but I, th I think we can engage in some holy speculation and get a pretty good idea about what was going on there. There were some people out there who were building the temple, and they thought, boy, if we just do this work, it's kind of like a good luck charm. And if we just do what God wants us to do, if we rebuild this temple, then that's going to guarantee we're going to have a good harvest, and we're not going to get sick, and, and our money's not going to run out, and all those other kind of things. And then there were another group, they're kind of like when I drive along Tangerine Road, you know, and they've been doing this road work that's taken forever. I mean, if they wanted to, they could finish it in about two days. But what they have is they have one guy working and six guys standing around watching the one guy work. And I think what some of the people thought, they thought, you know, if we just hang around with these people that are working, maybe that'll kind of rub off on us and God will give us credit for that. And we'll be considered holy because we're, we're gathering around with God's people who are doing His work. God says, no, that's, that's not how you become holy. So that's the, the first issue that they really have to deal with here, the first question. Then he asks them a second question, which is going to deal with a completely different issue. And here's the second question. If someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And this time the, the priests answered correctly again. They said yes. Because all throughout the Old Testament Scriptures, God had made it clear that, that if something, if you came in contact with something that was unclean, that it would defile you. It would make you unclean. And so that's what he's telling the people here. As we put it this morning, sin is. Sin is contagious. That's really what he's what he's telling the people here as he asks these two questions, that, that holiness is not contagious, but sin is. They were engaging in all these things that thought they were going to make them holy, but it, it didn't do that. So we see here, as we've said, that, that holiness is not contagious, but sin is. And if that's the case, and I believe it is, then there's there's really two things that we need to deal with this morning from this passage. Number one, we need to talk about then how do I become holy if I don't just do it by hanging around other holy people? And then the second thing that we want to deal with, how do I, how do I at least lessen the chances that I'm going to get infected by the sin that's all around me in the world? So let's deal with this, this first idea first. And and first of all, I want to make it really clear, only God can make anything holy, right? Would you agree with that? We, we can't do that. But at the same time, just like we saw last week when we looked at Philippians chapter 2, there is some work that's involved on our part in order to develop a holy lifestyle. Remember we saw the passage there in Philippians where he says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So there's some things that we need to do. So, so what are those things that we need to do? How is it that we can develop kind of a holy lifestyle? And, and, and frankly, the things that we can do, they're not, they're not all that hard. And they're probably not different than anything else that you've heard in the past. This week, as I was uh, preparing, I came across this short video I'm going to show in just a second. 
It's a guy named Kevin DeYoung. He's a pastor. He's a theologian. And uh, in this short video, as he's being interviewed, he describes four things that, that are really, I think, common to us that are kind of the keys to developing a, this holiness. So as you watch the video, I want you to listen for those four things. I've given you a place to write them down in, uh, in your sermon outline as well. So let's go ahead and watch the video. Kevin, you said earlier that sanctification is an extraordinary calling being lived out by ordinary mm -hmm. people you know, like us. You know, by the gospel of grace, we're living out this miracle. As Pastor John says, we're acting the miracle. And in that, you, you, you talk about the, the means of grace and how ordinary they are. Uh, prayer, Bible reading, local church fellowship, the sacraments. There's really nothing extraordinary about those means of grace from one sense. Um, explain to us what role those play in uh, this process of sanctification and yeah. growing holiness. And they're even called traditionally the ordinary means of grace. Uh, it's so important because it, it's, it's so easily overlooked because it's so obvious. It seems like what you would learn in Sunday school. You pray, you read your Bible, go to church. And in the sacraments, we sometimes don't think of. But if someone reads the book or someone's listening to this or someone just in their own life is saying, okay, I, I'm convinced of the importance of holiness, what do I do? What, what are the steps to, to live out this grace? These would be the four things that I would say. And we're apt to uh, roll our, our eyes and think, yeah, I've tried that. But really, if, if we're honest, if we think of a mature godly Christian, someone that we really respect, who has lived an exemplary life, uh, who has been a pillar of his or her church, community, we just learn from, you can guarantee that person has been faithful in the Word of God, mm. has spent many hours on their knees or in their chair or on a walk in prayer, and they have been faithfully involved in their local church, and they have, per they have you know, taken the means of grace from the Lord's table. You, you, just, you can count on it. And yet we can easily scoff at it and think there, there must be something else. There must be some secret. There must be some shortcut. But there isn't because holiness is pursuing a person. And how will you know and have communion with this person except in his word where God manifests himself or in prayer where the Puritans would say you have friendly converse with God or in your local fellowship. I was really struck and, and used this line from John Owen is he was talking about uh, communion with God and local church that mean this this body has communion with God's son mm -hmm. and so when you say I, I don't need that group and he, his point is no matter how backwards they seem how strange they seem this is where you go to meet Christ's body this is where you go to have fellowship with those who have fellowship with God and then at the table, it's just vastly overlooked that there is a real presence, not a transfigured uh, bodily presence, but a real presence of Christ there. He meets us. He comforts us. He nurtures us. And because holiness is the pursuit of Christ, all of these means of grace usher us into the presence of Christ. And thus they're extraordinary means, aren't they? Yeah, are extraordinary. They're ordinary because you can say, oh, okay. I can, I can do that. I mean, anyone who says, I can't be holy. Well, here are these four means of grace. Can you pursue those? Well, I, I guess. And, and the fact of the matter is, we just don't often try them or try them very well or very long, and then we give up. But to continue with these ordinary means will, I think, yield extraordinary results. Okay, a quiz. See if we can pick out all four. What are the four things that he talked about in the, in the video? Bible reading, number one, yeah. Prayer. Local church fellowship. And the Lord's table. Okay. Now, there's really nothing new there, is there? Have you heard those things from me before? Probably. One of the reasons that I want to show the video today is I, I know what happens. You hear something from the same person over and over and over again, and after a while, what do you do? You, send, you tend to 
start kind of shutting it out, right? Those of you who are parents know exactly what I'm talking about, right? You tell your kids something, you try to impress it upon them, and you tell them over and over and over again, and they never really seem to get it. And then one day, maybe even when they're adult, they come home and they go, Mom, Dad, guess what I just heard from so-and-so? And you're thinking in your mind, well, I've told you that for the last 25 years, but you know, it takes someone else to hear it from someone else sometimes before we get it. And maybe that's true of some of these things. Sometimes they, they, you hear them over and over and over so much that they just kind of come rote. So I want to give you a little different way of, of maybe seeing them, hearing them from someone else. Because really, these things are, as he said, they're things all of us can do. There's no, there's no shortcut. There's no magic to becoming holy. It's these things that, that we do in our everyday life to, as he said, to get to know the person. God and who He is. So I think that's, that's really important for us today. The second thing that I want to deal with this morning is not only how do I become holy, but, but how do I lessen the chances that I'm going to get infected by the sin of the world? I mean, think about it. Just like I shared with the kids this morning in our physical lives, there are a lot of things that we do to try to remain healthy. We, we eat healthy, we exercise, we wash our hands, we, we try to stay away from sick people. And no matter how meticulous we are at those things, guess what? Sometimes we still get sick, don't we? But does that mean that we shouldn't do all those other things? Absolutely not, because they all lessen the chance that we're going to get sick. And we need to do the same thing spiritually. There's some things that we can do that don't guarantee that we aren't going to get infected by the sin in the world because it's all around us, but they certainly lessen the chances that we're going to get infected by that sin. So I want to share three things with you that I think are, are very practical in, in a, how we go about doing that. The first thing is this, that isolation is not the answer. And that's the answer that a lot of, a lot of people look for. They say, well, I'll just go off and I'll be by myself and I won't be around anyone else. And if I'm not around non-Christians and, and I kind of don't associate with them, then, then maybe I can somehow keep from getting tainted by the sin, infected by the sin. And that's something that people have done all throughout history. Do you realize in the time of Jesus, there were this, this group called the Essenes. And what they did is they go off to this place called Qumran, which is around the Dead Sea, and they go out in the middle of the wilderness and they sit there and they study the Bible and they write down scriptures over and over again and they, they, they write all these documents and they hide them away in a cave and they're what we would know today as the Dead Sea Scrolls. But what they did is they just kind of isolated themselves. Today, people still do the same thing. Do you know that right around Tucson, there are monasteries where people do that, where they isolate themselves and they, they say, I'm just going to study the Bible and I'm going to pray engage in prayer, and I'm not going to associate with the outside world. But there's a couple problems with that. The biggest problem I see is that it, it keeps us from doing the most important task that Jesus has given to us, and that is to take the, the kingdom of God and bring it near to other people. We've talked about that all year as we all the way back to the book of Acts where we've talked about this idea of taking the kingdom of God and bringing it near to other people. And if we're not near other people, how do we do that? The Apostle Paul had to address this whole issue with the church at Corinth. And in his first letter to the church at Corinth, he had to write to them about the fact that, that they were not to avoid associating with unbelievers. Here's what he writes. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. He, here's what he says. He says, within the body of Christ, there is this idea you should be separated from people who have lifestyles like that. But he says, if I were to tell you to do that with the rest of the world, you'd have to go out of the world because that's the only way you can do that. And I think the biggest evidence that to me, that God doesn't want us to just isolate ourselves is the very fact that He leaves us here on this earth that when we accept Jesus Christ and we commit our lives to Christ and put our faith in Him. Because all that other stuff, we could do in heaven with Jesus. We could pray, we could study the Bible, but we can't tell other people about Jesus. We can't bring the kingdom near to them. So isolation is not the answer. 
but neither is license. And that's what a lot of people do. They go all the way to the other extreme and they say, well, I want to reach the unbelieving world around me, so guess what? I'm going to become just like them. I'm going to hang out with them all the time. I'm going to do all the things that they do. And they, they excuse it by saying, well, I'm just trying to reach them for Jesus. But the Apostle Paul dealt with that pretty specifically in his letter to the church at Rome. In Romans chapter 6, he wrote about this idea of license, about people just sinning over and over. He says, but what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? What he's saying there is you can't go around just living this, this sinful lifestyle and claiming, well, God will forgive me for it and just keep on doing it. And that's what some people have done with this idea of saying, well, I'm just doing it so that I, I can reach other people for Christ. So if neither of those two extremes are the answer, then, then what is the answer? How do I, how do I live between those extremes? And, and the thing is, I can't give you any kind of set rules, but I can give you a principle. And that is this. I need to remember my objective. I need to remember what I'm here to do. I'm here to, to bring the kingdom of God near to other people. That's my objective. And as I said, I, I can't give you any rules on how you avoid those extremes, but there's a great principle that's found in the book of Jude. It's a little tiny book in the New Testament we're going to be looking at actually in a couple of weeks. And in the book of Jude, we find this advice about how we're to go about rescuing those who are dead in their sins. Jude writes, And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. I think that's some great advice there. And it really kind of helps us to understand how we do this. I mean, think about it. If one of your kids was in your house and your house is on fire, I think everyone here who is a parent, you would go in to rescue your kids, right? Right? But when you went in there, you would want to get your kids and get out of there and not spend too much time in there so you don't get burned up yourself. It's not like you're going to hang around and, and play another game of Candy Crush on your computer while you're in there, right? You're going to get in and you're going to get out so that you don't get burned. And I think that's some good, a good illustration for us about when we're trying to to rescue people, trying to bring the kingdom of near, we ought to have that mindset. I want to spend enough time with them in order to rescue them, but not too much time so that I get burned. Let me illustrate how, how that works, at least in one area of my life. I've shared with you before that one of the things I do in order to have some contact with non-Christians is I referee high school sports. And I have a lot of contact with those other officials. I go to meetings with them. I go to training sessions with, with large groups. I have interactions with individual referees, too, because I go and work matches with them. And you know what? Because most of those people know I'm a pastor, over the years, I've been able to have some really interesting spiritual discussions with some of those people. Actually, some very deep ones with a few of them. So I have that, that contact. But you know what? At the same time, a lot of these officials like to go out and have a little fun after the match is over, after the meeting's over. And they usually go to a bar, and I choose not to be a part of that because I know what's going to go on if I go there. They're going to be drinking too much. They're going to be telling off-color stories. They're going to be using language that I don't want to hear over and over again. And so I... I want to be able to snatch them out of the fire, but I don't want to get burned. And I think that's a, an important lesson for us about how we do that. So we see from this passage that, that <clears throat> holiness is not contagious, but sin is. That brings us to the last part of, uh, of the book of Haggai here where we find the last message. And in this fourth message, you can look at it later. I'm, I don't have time to go into it in detail. But Haggai tells Zerubbabel about this time when God is going to shake the heavens and the earth. And when Zerubbabel is going to be his signet ring. And what we find in this last part is a, 
a beautiful messianic prophecy that has not been completely filled yet to this day. And so there we, we find that, that, that we can have, again, he's telling them to look forward, to be encouraged by these things and, and, and what we're doing there. And so there's beautiful prophecy that he ends with there and, and leaves them on a hopeful note. I think the very fact that you're here this morning means that you probably are interested in developing holiness in your life. I don't think you'd be here if you weren't. I think that's one of the most important reasons that you're here today. And so that this morning, I pray that as you've been here, that God has been speaking to you through His Word about, about what you can do to develop holiness and how you can do some things to avoid being infected by sin. The fact is that you're never going to become more holy just by hanging out with holy people. It doesn't work that way. But if you'll do the work that's necessary to develop that holiness, then, then God has a promise for you. This is really interesting. If you go through in this second chapter of Haggai, here's what he tells them. He says that, once you develop holiness, here's what I'm going to do for you. Here's how I'm going to bless you. Look at what he says. God says, I am with you. He says, I will fill my house with glory. I will give peace. I will bless you. I have chosen you. Wouldn't you like God to say those things to you? I know I would. So as we close this morning, I want to make this, this really practical for I think all of us from time to time, it's an important thing for us to sit down and just kind of evaluate, where am I in my walk with Jesus? Where am I in developing holiness in my life? There's a, a, a ministry out there called Disciple Labs, and I've given you a, a link in your, in your sermon outline this morning. I'll send it out in the newsletter tomorrow if that'll make it easier for you to find it. The elders looked at this a while back, and and we've been considering how we might be able to use it maybe someday within the church to kind of evaluate where we are as a body and, and to plan for that. But for right now, we've decided that, that we need to do some other things first. But I do think this can be an important tool for you to use individually. So if you'll go to that link, there's a survey there. It probably won't take you more than 10 minutes to do. And what it'll do is it'll help you to evaluate in your life these different areas of, of holiness in your walk with the Lord. And so I encourage you to go through and do that. And then, maybe just pick out one area and say, here's an area where, where I could really grow. And if you need some help with how to grow in that area, then contact any of the elders, because that's what we're here for. And we would love to help you grow in your walk with Jesus. So please, take the time to do that. I know a lot of times when I, I ask you to do something like this, you leave here and you forget it. But this is for your own good so that you can evaluate where you are in your walk with Jesus because holiness is not contagious, but sin is. Let's pray.